thank you, Mark, has introduced me in two ways. Uh, good good uh, connection from the last paper to be talking about Lebanon a little more. Um, I'm going to talk about religious leaders in Lebanon. Um, and I'm interested in, in religious leaders as a way of, um, you know, a lot of what we're doing um, today and last night is, is trying to destabilize uh, sectarianism as a category. Um, and I think that's going to be fall short of doing the same thing with religion. Um, so looking at religious leadership as a way of doing that. Um, and you may recognize, I don't know if you can make out very well, this cartoon, cartoon from 1975, a, a Lebanese newspaper. Um, the, you might recognize, maybe you can recognize the characters even. Uh, you have, um, um, yes, Hassan Khalid on the left, and also Sadr in the middle. Um, and the, the Maronite patriarch of the time. Um, so you have this, this image <clears throat> in a cartoon like this on the eve of the civil war in Lebanon, uh, showing the religious heads of the various Islamic and Christian communities uh, uh, representing Lebanese politics as a sectarian race, as a sectarian competition. Um, and Forty years later, uh, here's another cartoon, maybe maybe more difficult to make out, but at the top of this kind of social pyramid, um, uh, lovely social pyramid, you have the religious leaders again in the very top rung, um, and uh, and so again you have these religious leaders um, implicated in Lebanon's social ills, this time presiding over a system of sectarian divided rule. Um, in which the dirty work, if you can make characters, is done by this hierarchy of, of politicians, of the media, security services, thugs, and so on. Um, and so it's easy to see why uh, religious leaders might be shown at the top of a hierarchy like this. They do cast long shadows in Lebanese politics. Their opinions receive a national platform. Uh, they're routinely consulted by politicians, diplomats, foreign heads of state. Um, so if you're familiar with Lebanon, you, you, know, you see these figures in the news uh, weekly, um, sometimes daily. And the persistence of this kind of powerful religious leadership is often referenced as a key indicator that sectarianism remains a powerfully divisive social phenomenon. Um, from the simple fact of the religious leader's prominence, the various, com uh, various common sense conclusions are regularly drawn by commentators. And these are, are two uh, relatively recent examples from scholars uh, who I uh, highly respect. Uh, that's why I chose to quote you. Um, <clears throat> but with whom I disagree on some points. Um, but firstly, the persistence of strong religious leadership is taken to indicate that national citizenship has never fully taken root. Uh, in Rola uh, Hosseini's words, um, the clergy has always played a role in Lebanese public life because of the nature of allegiance in Lebanon. Commitment to the nation comes after loyalty to the clerical leader of one sect. And related to this question of, of loyalty or belonging um, is a second, more kind of structurally inclined conclusion. And the, the argument goes that the strength of traditional religious institutions reflects the weakness of state institutions. Uh, Fiona McCallum and others uh, suggest that religion once served as a kind of pre-modern proto-state, effectively, uh, providing security and structure in an uncertain world. Modern states may generally have taken over that role, but whenever states fail to deliver, religions will step up again, bringing their extensive infrastructure to bear. In the process, uh, as, as you'll see in the quote from, from Fiona McCallum, uh, these religious institutions re-entrench sub-state identities. Um, this discussion of religious leadership and sectarianism raises several important questions. Firstly, can we talk about any particular kinds of institutions or forms of organization as definitively sectarian, um, uh, by which it's usually meant as opposed to national? Um, 
And I think as we try to avoid centralizing sectarianism by doing it uh, you know, generally as a, as a practice or as a discourse, uh, the kinds of things we've been talking about, sometimes we struggle to do the same with religion. Secondly, uh, does religious nationalism have to be a problem in multi-confessional countries, or can we have a number of uh, harmoniously different notions of belonging? Um, the third of the questions I want to address here is whether state failure or weakness is a sufficient explanation of the strength <coughs> of sectarianism. Uh, it's easy, given current events, to assume that state strength and sectarianism are inversely related. Um, everywhere, everywhere that we see states failing, where they are uh, Syria <coughs> and Lebanon, uh, we seem also to see sectarian conflict at its height. My research on religious leaders in Lebanon offers uh, very partial answers to these questions, um, but above all offers a cautionary tale to put us on guard against certain easy misconceptions, I think. On the face of it, it looks as though religious leaders uh, are an age-old part of Lebanese society. Each community has a head who claims to represent a lineage or tradition going back uh, centuries, each with its own distinctive titles or styles of dress. Uh, here we have more or less current ones. Um, from left to right, you know, the Druze have their Sheikh al uh, Sunnis have a Mufti on the Ottoman model. Um, uh, Shia have, have Sheikhs or Imams, uh, whom one is recognized as, as senior. Um, and various Christian groups like the Maronites here have, have patriarchs or bishops. But amid this picture of diversity, I think if we look more closely, we see a great deal of change uh, of change in these institutions across the board uh, through the 20th century. And the picture isn't just one of secularization, um, even a kind of halting secularization, uh, but it's a more complex picture, a more confusing one. Um, and to help you picture the, the broad changes I want to outline, I'm going to sketch them out on this chart. Um, it's um, it's going to be uh, a major oversimplification, of course, so bear with me somewhat. Um, to begin with, um, many accounts have been written of the decline of the Maronite patriarchs. Uh, this line lineage of patriarchs going back more than a millennium. Um, but this decline has proved not to be a terminal decline. Um, I guess uh, uh, Fiona McCallum, who I quoted earlier, uh, might call it uh, secularization interrupted. Um, but just as significantly, this was also not simply a fall from grace, a fall from kind of pre-modern grace. Uh, the patriarchate's power had always fluctuated. And in the 20th century, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, um, it's at an unprecedented height due to upheavals in the 19th century. Um, about which, of course, some of you know more than I do. Um, um, if we add to this chart, oh I'm sorry. If we add to this chart, uh, Sunnis. Uh, the Sunnis transformed uh, their Mufti of Beirut into a Mufti of the Lebanese Republic in the 1930s, creating one of Lebanon's most powerful uh, national institutions. Um, so there you have an opposite case of, a, of institution building as opposed to decline. Um, if we look at the, the Druze and also the, I'm sorry, I don't know why this keeps happening. Um, also the Shia communities. Um, these two communities slowly elevate figureheads of their own to match the Mufti. Um, and the, the Druze, something not really portrayed on here, the Druze actually had two or three figures bearing this title of Sheikh and Ap, um, until all but one died off in 1970. It was kind of streamlined <coughs> into one. Um, amongst the Shia, an altogether new institution of religious leadership was created, uh, famously by um, Sheikh Musa Sadr. Um, 
So at different times and in different ways, all three Islamic leaderships underwent considerable institutional growth uh, in the first 50 years of Lebanese statehood. Scholars of each community have tended to explain these ups and downs in different ways, according to their particular uh, religious and social histories. You get these kind of partial histories. Um, but a common pattern emerges quite clearly. You know, you map it out like this, view them side by side, um, and what we see is a convergence of these kind of historical uh, institutional trajectories. Coming from very different starting points, uh, Lebanon's religious leaderships rose or fell in influence more or less rapidly, but all arrive at roughly equivalent status in public life. They certainly preserved the flavors of their distinctive histories and religious traditions, you know, from the pictures we had up before. Um, uh, you have, they have different hats, turbans, robes, also forms of address, styles of speech, and so on. Um, but in crucial ways, they developed towards a common institutional model of Lebanese religious leadership. And this model consists of a single figurehead headquartered in Beirut, who stands both as the officially recognized representative of a community and as the head of a nationwide clerical hierarchy. The leader is elected from a clerical core and holds executive authority in conjunction with a legislative council. The state grants each leader certain quasi-diplomatic privileges, including a security detail, uh, a degree of immunity, and the highest rank in formal protocol besides the President of the Republic. The state also recognizes, uh, famously, each institution's right to legislate on personal status, laws, on our path, uh, schools of the community. And these laws are published in the Parliamentary Gazette, upheld by courts, and enforced by the police. So it's important to realize that, modern, that the modern Lebanese state didn't just preserve a pre-modern religious, uh, sectarian, social order, but created an altogether new system of communal administration embedded in the principles and institutions of the political regime in the 20th century. So why has this transformation been somewhat glossed over by the history? Um, I think because it was framed by its French colonial architects as a simple matter of legal recognition, uh, recognition of a, le of a religious mosaic that they imagined was already there. Common sense told European colonizers that religion defined Oriental society and that religions would have religious leaders with whom they could deal as natural interlocutors. Uh, so I think the French arriving on the shores of the Levant effectively said, take me to your religious leader. And the, the, the product was that these communities who didn't, uh, mostly didn't have anything that we might think of as a religious leader, um, had to create one. So, for instance, Ottoman muftis were simply legal functionaries, as many of us are aware, um, providing advisory services to local society and to courts. Uh, similarly, in the, the Druze community, another example, um, the title Sheikh um, uh, was held by officials appointed from amongst the lower sheikhs uh, simply to resolve disputes over al Qaf property. Um, so these, these various kinds of functionaries, clerical functionaries, legal functionaries, were empowered uh, for the first time um, as spokesmen for whole communities and, and even for religions somehow. Um, as a result, they were also eventually put in charge of a new domain called religious affairs, uh, that the secular state recognized as having special rights and privileges. So religious leadership, as we see it today, is a product of the modern state order, not its precursor. Indeed, I suspect that sectarian dynamics across the Middle East's failing states may have less to do with the absence of the state and more to do with the state's long-running articulation and institutionalization of religion. But certain questions still remain. Even if religious leadership cannot be untangled from the state, 
Has the state perhaps created its own enemy? What do religious leaders represent? And how responsible are they for the problem of sectarianism in a country like Lebanon today? <clears throat> Sorry. On one hand, these figures play a well-documented role in the maintenance of vertical divisions in society. They administer separate personal status regimes that, of course, place Lebanese citizens more or less rigidly within a subset of the population, uh, inhibiting intermarriage across communal lines. Um, and the religious elite have managed to block moves for civil marriage. If you can see this cartoon, a little small, I think, the script. Um, <clears throat> but it's a cartoon again about the um, uh, religious, all of the religious leaders' um, joint opposition to civil marriage and a reform of, of the personal status regime. Um, they also administer uh, confessional schools, universities, hospitals, other services that socialize individuals from an early age into these commonly founded lives. Um, and you could say that their very existence as prominent public representatives of sects uh, could be said to reinforce perceptions of difference, maybe notions of communal loyalty, uh, whether these leaders intend them to or not. Um, and, I, and I think in some crucial ways they don't. Um, because on the other hand, the religious leader's relation to communal populations is not organic. Their status as leaders is not, is not dependent on, uh, on a followership nor does the common assumption that a religious leader naturally represents his community's religious essence somehow uh, obviously stand up to any scrutiny, whether social scientific or whether theological. Um, the leaderships we're talking about here are constituted primarily by their relation to state infrastructure. They're embedded in the culture of a state-orientated elite. Uh, and this elite station is consist consistently reflected in their political decision-making. At key moments, I think, in Lebanese history, these official religious leaders have chosen to oppose the dominant political currents uh, or mainstream public opinion, even within their own communities. So as an example of, of this, we can talk about the civil war of the 70s and 80s. Um, during a period when politics was dominated by sectarian logics of communal self-defense, uh, each of the official religious leaders, mufti, patriarch, so on, um, came out in opposition to armed militancy. While all of them supported regime reform, which was a key issue of contention of the war, they refused to envision any route to reform other than through the constitutional institutions. Uh, better, they said, Better to surrender some of our rights and privileges as a community than to undermine the sovereignty of the state that belongs to all of us. They backed up this status policy with a common vision of Lebanon as a final national homeland for all sects. In a nation of, of brother citizens, the way they put it, there is no communal other to distrust or to defend against. Most powerfully, I think, they turned the militia's sectarian discourse of, of believers versus unbelievers um, against the militias themselves. So in sermons reproduced in the national media, uh, the religious leaders preached that true, believer, true believers were the good, pious citizens of all sects who kept faith in the nation state and who therefore suffered at the hands of the unbelieving, uncivil militiamen. Um, but if you think this kind of talk sounds uh, naive, naively ineffective perhaps in a time of civil war in the face of militarized politics, uh, the militias themselves didn't agree. Um, the official religious leaders uh, made themselves outcasts effectively. Um, other dissenters to the militia hegemony were slowly assassinated and driven into exile. And the same fate eventually caught up with, with the mufti we saw earlier, Hassan Khalid. Um, who was killed by a car bomb in 1989. Um, and in the aftermath of the war, these leaderships emerged as strong as or stronger than ever, receiving even greater official recognition in the post-war constitution. 
And some say that this renewed provenance of religious leaders today reflects the sectarian polarization of Lebanese society since the war. Um, and you can certainly say that that is a feature of post-war society. Um, but I disagree with this assumption that religious leaders must inherently be at odds or in competition. Uh, you know, this, this kind of competitive spirit portrayed in the cartoon. Um, Lebanon's official religious leaders emerged from the war in force uh, because they came out on the winning side altogether. It was their model of, strong, of a strong central state, um, albeit with a, a moderately adjusted power sharing system. Um, their model that was enshrined in the Taif Accords in 89. Um, now I've got to bring this to a conclusion. Um, I think these religious leaders make a great case study for a conference on sectarianism uh, because their story is full of ironies and seeming contradictions that should keep us uh, somewhat on our toes. Um, conventional wisdom tells us that the religious heads of sects should effectively be walking embodiments of sectarianism. Um, they are, after all, the prime enforcers of social segregation, um, and their job description, even written in Lebanese law, is to represent the sect to the state. Um, but in practice, we find these religious leaders acting as representatives of the state to the sect, the reverse. Uh, representing the ideology of the state, uh, its national values, its institutional interests, um, often above the factional interests or values of the sect. And in this story of, of Lebanese religious leaders, um, we see sectarian and national institutions as contemporaneous. We see their powers as, as being symbiotic, and we see their ideologies as being uh, harmoniously blended, I think. So we can't assume that the prominence of communal or religious institutions is antithetical to broader social cohesion. Uh, on one hand, we need to recognize the state's share of responsibility for sectarian conflict, even if it only manifests after the collapse of the state, um, which is often the way we see things today. Uh, on the other hand, we need to recognize the potential for religious institutions to produce cohesive national identities and values and the potential for religious communities to be sites of citizenship formation, uh, as I think we see them in Western states quite often. And I'll leave you there. Thank you very much.